Welcome back everyone to another Mythfall devlog. If you're new to the channel, I'm building a browser-based bullet hell MMO from scratch in Golang and documenting the process along the way. This week my goal was to clean up a few rendering issues that Mythfall still has. I wanted to finalize my font rendering and UI system so that it'd be more useful for future menus and widgets that I'll eventually need to build. A couple of weeks ago, I switched away from pixel fonts to regular rasterized fonts, and the reason for that was because pixel fonts are a little bit hard to read, um, whereas rasterized fonts are a little bit more smoother and uh, a little bit easier on the eyes, I'd say. Um, and it's also hard to scale pixel fonts at fractional values. Uh, so rasterized fonts are a little bit easier to work with as well uh, for like various sizes that I want to hit. The one downside with rasterized fonts is that despite the fact that I can scale them uh, from very small to very large, if you rasterize them as small and then you scale them to be very large, they end up looking very blurry and grainy like this. Uh, so the one big solution that people use uh, to solve this is called sign distance fields. And uh, this is kind of what it changes to. You basically generate a special uh, texture atlas uh, for each rune. And then when you render it, you, you have a special shader uh, that goes through and draws uh, a, spe a specific color depending on how far away from the center point of the text you are. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail on that. But uh, this is the general premise of what we're doing. I learned about this from a, a thin matrix video from a long, long time ago. Eight years ago, he made this video. I'm using a somewhat more newer version of sign distance field text rendering. But yeah, this is where I learned from it. This is a good video to check out if you want to look more into more details about how it actually works. So the first thing I did was I went and looked for a tool that could generate the sign distance field uh, texture atlas that I needed to use. Um, this is kind of how it looks like. This is a specific, this is a special type of sign distance fields, which is called uh, multi-channel sign distance fields is what I'm using. Uh, but this generates uh, several different types. You can see the uh, this is like the normal text atlas. I don't know what this one is. This one's the normal sign distance field that you'll learn about from this video. And then this is the one that I'm using. It's called multi-channel sign distance fields. You'll basically write a shader which averages these colors together and that'll give you the distance uh, from the center point. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they generate these uh, uh, texture atlases. They look kind of like this. So they look a little goofy looking, but uh, when you average the numbers together, uh, every single point ends up telling you the distance away from the center line of the text. And the reason they do it for these three channels is to make the like edges on the letters a little bit sharper. So some of the downsides of regular sign distance fields is like the A, for example, would look a little bit curved. But on these multi-channel ones, it's a little bit sharper. Also in my research, I came across this Red Blob Games article about sign distance field rendering, and uh, he goes into a lot of depth about this. Uh, some of the experiments that he was running on, I think he tried a, different few, a few different types and stuff like that. Uh, but towards the end of it, he uh, writes out a full-fledged shader, which is kind of like this one, I guess, um, which lets you zoom the text in and out and see it scale up and down. And you can change things like the uh, outline blur, the, uh, where is the, like the threshold between the, um, where the white part ends in terms of like the distance away from the center line. There's one that also does the width, the outline width. Yeah, here's outline width as well. So you can scale these things up dynamically just in the shader by setting uniforms. That's another nice property is it's really easy to uh, modify text depending on how you want it. So if you don't want an outline, you can uh, remove it all and you'll just have a regular text. So uh, that's the strategy I decided to go with. So I was able to use his shader. He actually uh, publicized it and it is in here. So it's Apache licensed, uh, which means it's open source. So I was able to adapt this to use it in my game, which is very handy because it uh, is quite a lot of different, um, or it adds a lot of different features to the sign distance field text rendering. A lot of them I don't use, but uh, some of them are helpful. I mostly am just using right now the uh, white or the inner and outer like border uh, colorings. So, so yeah. So I basically use this to generate these sign distance field text texture atlas like that. And then I was using uh, this shader, this Apache license shader by Red Blobs Games uh, to do the actual uh, shader rendering of it. Uh, one downside with this is that it does uh, separate my shaders from regular sprites and text uh, renderings. So before in Mythfall, all of the text and the sprites were rendered with the same shader. So I never had to switch shaders, which is a nice performance bump um, because you don't have to switch shaders in between. Uh, but now that I'm changing to this, I actually do have to change shaders, but it's not that frequent. I think I measured it. It was about uh, 10 times per frame or something like that. So not terrible, especially when my game is mostly like fill rate limited for uh, lower end devices. Um, and I could probably optimize that as well. Uh, but it did require me to rewrite my render a little bit. Uh, there was a problem with my render where uh, because of how I architected it before, it was very difficult to change shaders. This was my original renderer architecture that my uh, text rendering was built on top of, or I guess my general rendering was built on top of for Mythfall. But basically I would build these uh, render pass objects, which were kind of like, uh, they would last the entire lifetime of the game.
name and they would be for, for, for specific things. So for example, I'd have a render pass for uh, rendering all of the game world objects to a specific frame buffer. And then I have a rendering pass for rendering all of the UI elements. And then that frame buffer that I mentioned before would also get rendered to the screen. That was called the screen pass. Um, so how these would get set up is I basically go through a process where I'd set up the shader, the material, the sorting mode uh, for this rendering pass in case I wanted to depth sort things uh, specifically. And then I would just do a bunch of draws of sprites to this render pass. Then at the very end, I would, uh, or sorry, the render pass when I draw something would add it to a draw command list. And then eventually when I was drawing it uh, to the actual window, it would go through and sort all of the draw commands and then uh, push all of those vertices to the vertex buffer pool, uh, which is an internal object that I manage, uh, which basically goes through and tries to maintain or tries to just append vertices to it before it submits it all to OpenGL for the draw call. I mean, it's able to batch together uh, vertices that maintain the same material. So if they have the same um, like uniforms, they have the same texture, things like that, they're able to uh, batch them all together. So the one downside with this is that because the shader is set up at the very start, I can't change shaders inside of this. So that ends up forcing me to batch things together uh, as long as they have the same shader. And then now that I'm changing shaders quite a lot between the pixel art shader and the sign distance field text rendering shader, it's uh, kind of troublesome to use this. So I rewrote it and uh, this is what it looks like now. So the new architecture is a lot simpler. Like if you'll see here, I have this kind of Uber object, which is the render pass. I kind of broke this up into two different things. One of them is the uh, material batcher, which kind of shares a lot of the logic that was that used to be in here uh, for making sure we could batch together vertices. So I kind of have this, vert this uh, global vertex batcher, which kind of maintains the current state that we are drawing things to the vertex buffer pool at. And if we ever change the material, then um, this will just build a new vertex buffer with that new material uh, for that new draw call that needs to happen. So if you ever change materials, we have to submit a different draw call with a different vertex buffer uh, because the underlying like uniforms have changed uh, for that vertex buffer. So now there's kind of like two modes that I can use this in uh, where I'll draw the sprite in the material either to the global vertex buffer, in which case it'll just immediately get pushed into the vertex buffer pool. So it's kind of, this is like the immediate mode drawing path uh, where if I want to draw something immediately to a specific target, I can do that. Um, I also have this like, um, I guess I'll call it like a deferred rendering mode where I'll draw the sprite and material to a sprite sorter object. And this is used, for example, when I need to sort um, the player so he can walk behind trees and then walk in front of trees depending on uh, his position on the Y axis. Uh, so I'll push all of these sprites for the world pass uh, into the sprite sorter. The sprite sorter will go through and sort everything. And then eventually I draw the sprite sorter to the global vertex batcher. And then the sprite sorter will uh, execute that in, and it'll push all of the sprites in in the correct order. And that's kind of the main function of this. So it's kind of like I'm splitting up the render pass into two different components, one for sorting, one for uh, batching together vertices. And this has seemed to work pretty well. It's also nice because now I can just define different materials. So for example, a material right now has, uh, it's got the shader that I want to draw with, the texture that I want to draw with, uh, specific uniforms depending on what the shader is, and uh, then some uh, other like OpenGL modes like the blend mode, the depth mode, and the coal mode. Uh, so it's pretty convenient to just like throw all this stuff into one object and then pass it into the global vertex batcher. And if all of this stuff matches, we can push it into the same vertex buffer pool. Uh, but if one of these has changed, like the shader changes, for example, because now we want to render text, uh, then the global vertex batcher will detect that, spin off a new vertex buffer inside of this vertex buffer pool, uh, and then uh, draw that one to OpenGL or draw the last one that needed that finished drawing to OpenGL. So that way I can kind of maintain a strict ordering of how things uh, uh, get drawn. I think this will be very useful in the future if I ever want to do, if I ever do want to write like, write like some specific shader for some specific thing like lightning or I don't know, some random thing. Then I can easily do this now because I'll have like uh, all the infrastructure in place for it. So this was a nice little uh, upgrade, I think. All right, the uh, next thing that I worked on this week was uh, rewriting my UI system. Uh, my original uh, attempt at writing the UI system was a little bit bad, I guess. <laughs> it was kind of clunky and hard to work with and it was hard to make changes to. I feel like every single time, every single time I tried to change something in it, I'd break something else. So I ended up rewriting it. And also there's a few features I wanted to add. There's a lot of reasons to rewrite this. Um, I decided to just go ahead and do it. I found this good uh, article series on uh, UI development or like the implementation for UIs uh, on this website called Digital Grove. I think it's some guy's uh, like personal blog. So he writes a lot of, uh, or he wrote some articles about uh, immediate mode GUIs, which is the type of GUI that I like. And I'll show you guys a little bit about how that works. He wrote a few articles about that and you can check those out in the description if you want. Um, I'll link it there. But this was pretty helpful to get like a good grasp on uh, how it all fits together. So if you're not sure what a uh, immediate mode GUI is, just as a small example, immediate mode GUIs are just a, basically a 
like simple way to construct UIs. So for example, we can uh, uh, do a panel here, uh, UI.panel uh, with the panel bounds, which is just a rectangle that defines the boundary that we want to draw the panel at. Uh, then next we can construct a vertical layout list, uh, which basically takes the panel bounds, pads it, unpads it a little bit, and then says it's going to lay out five elements inside of that. So to equally space out each element uh, based off of that. And the next thing we'll do is we will uh, take the list next value uh, and unpad that as well to draw some panel text, which will just be like the title text. Um, and then we pass in the text style, which defines how we want to draw that text. Uh, then the final thing we can do is uh, do the, is generate this button rect, which is also taken from the layout list. We get the next rectangle out of the layout list. We unpad it, and then we construct a button. Um, so we do ui.button with the text of the button uh, and the button rect that we got from here. Uh, and then if the button ever gets clicked, then it'll return, th uh, this function will return true, and then we can execute whatever was inside the, the button. Right now, uh, we just have, we we're just going to print out some text uh, if we click the button. Uh, so if we go and build this, you'll see we have the panel title and then the uh, my button up here and we click that i will see some you clicked me there so that's kind of the general premise of how immediate mode guis uh, are designed to work the big emphasis is uh on just calling a function that knows how to do all of this work like track all of the states inside of here um and then pass in the data that you want to the widget and uh, so you can build up a lot of different types of widgets uh, this way uh, so for example you can do scroll boxes and uh, like you can click and these are all just buttons and this is like a button or this is technically a draw handle but it's kind of composed of a button uh, that you hold down and then these are, these are just regular buttons inside of this uh, scroll box and then you, there's also drag and drop you can do where these are kind of buttons uh, where when you click it and then drag a little bit it snaps to your cursor and it detects it as being dragged um, so you can drag and drop stuff into different slots and swap them around and all of that and you can also do like more complicated menus left buttons right buttons these are all just composed of uh, rectangles so it's pretty simple to lay this stuff out there's sliders horizontal sliders buttons text input you can like move the cursors around and stuff like that and uh, back stuff up and type new things so that's uh, pretty easy to work with there's also check boxes you can add as well um and uh, yeah so there's a lot of different stuff you can build with this and it's all just composed of these functions that you call uh, so it's pretty easy to build new widgets probably the most famous example of uh, im guis is one called dear im gui it's written in c plus plus uh, it has a lot of different widgets and features and stuff like that it's mostly used by people who are trying to design uh, like they'll build an engine they'll use this as uh, the engine editor in fact that's what i used it for uh, it's super good for that in my I am GUI rewrite, like the custom one that I built for my renderer, I needed to have a little bit more control over uh, how the buttons look and how the layout is uh, oriented. Whereas uh, Dear I am GUI, I think it's a little bit harder to do that manually. Uh, so all of my functions are built in. They'll pass. I'll pass in the rectangle where I want it to be drawn and how it should look uh, to whatever widget function I'm calling. But I did base up my uh, UI based off of this one a little bit. So it's nice uh, to use other people's ideas. And uh, this one's really good. So uh, if you are building an engine, I recommend trying this one out uh, because it's pretty solid. In fact, I actually use it too. I use it for my uh, game editor, I guess. Uh, I have little windows up here, which are uh, just widgets of like, if I want to find different files and stuff like that, I'll do that. Or if I want to generate like dungeons, I have little buttons to do that stuff. And there's check boxes and things that you can uh, toggle things off. And uh, they even have color pickers and stuff like that. So you can change uh, all this crazy stuff around. Um, so it's pretty handy to have uh, all of these features. Whereas if I built it through my own, it would I would have to build this whole like slider wheel, all of this stuff, which is kind of pretty complicated. So this one's a really nice one to have just for like editing things. And then uh, how this gets used in Mythfall is I basically have like rectangular cutouts of everything. Uh, so for example, this is a panel and then I cut out a grid layout inside of that panel. And then inside of those, I draw like each specific item sprite. And then in the settings menu, you can see this as well. Uh, there's just different buttons. These kind of swap you between different menus. Um, each menu has a like scroll bar on the side in case you want to go down and see more elements. And then patch notes. This is just uh, uh, all of the patches that I've added in Mythfall up to date. And then for uh, keybinds, this is just the keybind menu for swapping keybinds around. You can like change stuff. And uh, yeah, mute, unmute, stuff like that. Change to full screen, windowed mode. Uh, so there's a lot of different features that this has and uh but yeah this is kind of how it looks now uh, this is the re rewritten version so i think it looks pretty good uh there's even um i even redid how these shop menus look uh, so a little bit easier to work with and it's very it is very nice to be able to drag and drag this uh horizontal slider which is a feature that my last ui didn't have so uh, adding this stuff uh, definitely improves a lot i'm so pretty happy with how this turned out one thing i forgot to talk about was how the rectangle layout works 
Uh, so like this is a good gift. I didn't build this, but someone else did. I think they were using Raylib or something like that. But uh, this is the general premise behind the layout that I do. I basically pre-lay things out based off of rectangles, and then I draw buttons in specific spots. So as you can see, this kind of like hops through, and it's just cutting the top off of a layout box, or the right off of it, or the bottom, or the left. And you can kind of imagine how, uh, like if I was doing a list of different settings, I would just cut the top rectangle and then draw that setting there. And then I'd cut the next rectangle and then draw that setting there. You can kind of construct these layouts that way. So kind of how this looks uh, in code uh, for Mythfall is I kind of just have a scroll box object with a bunch of different items in it. So for example, I have like a divider setting, which just says chat. And then I have a checkbox, which lets people toggle the profanity filter on and off. Then I have a divider setting for HUD. Uh, and then I have one for the health scale slider to scale up the UI, the minimap scale, the inventory scale, the chat scale. And then the kind of the list can kind of just go on as far as I want. And then the scroll box manages scrolling up and down in that. And then each of these, all they get passed in uh, is the rectangle that you want to draw them at. Then they kind of just control what they want to do. So for example, this one just draws a block of text. Uh, the checkbox draws a checkbox, uh, which toggles a value. So it works pretty well. And it's really, really easy to add new widgets because uh, they just have to conform to this one interface. And uh, then I can draw them. Anyways, that's all I have for this week. As always, an absolutely massive thank you to all the supporters on YouTube, Twitch, GitHub, and Patreon. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.